hope that everybody is well. Uh, we are very grateful um, that you have prioritized this webinar over any um, other activities that you could be tonight, doing tonight, namely the football. Um, I want to welcome you all. Um, thank you to our speakers for joining us. Uh, thank you to you for tuning in to another episode uh, in a year-long uh, series of webinars from the New Arab. This evening, we um, will be discussing Grenfell, the tragedy that changed everything. Uh, for those who are new, the New Arab is a progressive and diverse London-based news organization covering the MENA region with a focus on democratic transition, human rights and social and economic justice. My name is uh, Malia Buatia, and I will be chairing uh, the discussion this evening. We're coming together uh, four years on since the tragic fire at Grenfell Tower in West London, which took the lives of 72 people, left many others injured and countless people traumatized. In so many ways, those events on the 14th of June, 2017, were a wake up call for those unaware of the longstanding social inequalities in Britain. The Grenfell fire was uh, a vivid demonstration of how violent state neglect is, uh, dangerous living conditions of the residents, the cutting corners for profitability and long-term social cleansing policies in the borough were problems that had long existed uh, and impacted the Grenfell community and which many had raised with local government only to be ignored. The so-called rejuvenation of the tower, which was more an exercise in hiding the living conditions and the residents uh, from the wealthy inhabitants of the Kensington and Chelsea borough, involved installing the aluminium composite material, uh, cladding on the outside of the building, which caught fire on that fateful night. The message was clear, poor people burned to death because rich people didn't want to see their poverty. <clears throat> The Grenfell fire raised many questions about institutionalized inequalities and the treatment of working class communities, as well as brown and black people and migrants uh, in the UK. Uh, over the next hour or so, we'll be discussing these issues and asking whether justice has been served for those killed, their loved ones and their communities, and whether four years on, anything has actually changed. We're honored to be hosting uh, a panel of esteemed speakers this evening. Uh, we're joined by uh, Fatima El Ghanouni, who is the Community Collaboration Consultant for Central and Northwest London NHS Foundation Trust. She's worked as an Islamic uh, psychotherapist and child and adolescent primary mental health therapist. Uh, Fatima has had a major role in helping ensure that the voice of the Grenfell community is heard at decision-making levels, both locally and nationally. Welcome, Fatima. Um, our next speaker will be Loki. He is a hip-hop artist and political campaigner who has performed everywhere from the Royal Albert Hall to the Oxford Union. He is a patron of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament and others. And finally, uh, Paul O'Connell uh, is a socialist and trade unionist. He teaches law at SOAS, uh, at SOAS University of London and was a founding member of the Left Campaign and the Beehive, which is a political education project centered on Greater Manchester. Thank you again to all of you uh, for taking the time to speak to everyone this evening. So just to start, uh, I'd like to, I'd like for us to, to to think back to uh, the night of the fire um, and to ask Fatima um, if you could perhaps share what the impact was on you uh, and your family. So I think that I think it's difficult to remember back and it's difficult to actually sort of speak about it as somebody who's personally impacted because for the last, I would say, three and a half years, I've kind of very much put myself at the heart of the sort of the change, the legacy piece. So it's been really difficult to kind of have both those roles, both within the system and part of the community, but also somebody that has a lived experience of such a horrific um, situation. Um, 
I'm, I feel very blessed that my, my family did survive, that they did make it out uh, in time and that I didn't lose uh, my grandchildren and my, you know, my, my son and my daughter-in-law's whole family. So I'm, I'm, I'm very blessed. But thinking back, I think I can only describe it as, a, as an out-of-body experience where something was happening, but I couldn't quite believe that it was happening. Um, and I suppose I wasn't, I wasn't at the site. I was uh, a bit further out and I couldn't get to the site, but I just remember thinking, we're in the UK, somebody's going to come, somebody's going to save people, and this will all be over a couple of hours, three hours, um, because there'd been fires there before, and I'd never really thought about the impact of, you know, you kind of think that things like this don't happen in so-called um, developed countries. Um, but that wasn't to be, and I can only remember those few days as just being really an out, out of body experience where I didn't quite know what was happening. Um, but yeah, just being very helpless and feeling just watching on and just seeing people um, suffer and scream and, and the chaos and the um, still very difficult to, to kind of recount that. But like I said, four years have just kind of been a continuous sort of I suppose for me, trying not to get too too caught up in those emotions because I nearly did lose, you know, my my family, um, and the chaos of all of that is is forever imprinted in my mind as it is in so many others. But so many people just were lost in that fire, and um, I think for me that the drive is to honour their to honour their lives, to honour all of the positivities, all the, you know, all the lives that have, you know, potential of marriages and graduations and newborn babies and families, extended family, you know, one family, five generation wiped out. And I suppose my, my, um, my energy is derived from actually building something of a legacy piece to remember all of that positivity that they had before, before the fire, but absolutely never forgetting that it was an unnecessary, a preventable disaster. And the only reason it happened was because of where it was located and who lived in, in that block. No, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I wonder if, Kareem, um, you could speak to us, having, you know, been part of that community, what, you think some of those, not just the short-term impacts, but long-term ones have been on that community since the fire? Well, I live next to the block. Um, <clears throat> you know, a friend of mine and his family uh, passed in there. On the night, it was apocalyptic. You know, what we were seeing, we had bits of the cladding in our hair. Um, you know, and one particular juxtaposition, I think, encapsulates the the equation here. So at one point, there was a family um, in which three generations of the same family died in there. And there was a point when they were on the either the 21st or the 23rd floor, there was a, um, what I think were the, the husband and wife waving, you know, um, a white, a white t-shirt or a towel. And so we're shouting up to them, they're shouting down, but we're seeing the fire move up uh, the building. It's also worth noting that without the Kyoto agreements, you wouldn't have had buildings insulated the way they have been, Grenfell being one of them. The crown on the top of the tower that caused it to turn around the building was for aesthetic reasons, but the, the, the cladding on the rest of the building was to lower carbon emissions. So I guess we'll, we'll, we'll get to that maybe later on in uh, the conversation, but... The point was when that when that fire was climbing up the building, uh, we were thinking, you know, there's no way the fire is going to reach them. And we see a helicopter come and it came within about um, probably 150 meters, probably less of the building. And we're thinking it's going to it's going to rescue them. You know, there was famous videos that came out of there 
you know, by someone who passed uh, with her daughters, uh, Rani Ibrahim, where she's talking about Tayarat, she's talking about the plane, she's talking about the helicopters, maybe they'll come and get us. Obviously, logistically, there are those that, uh, you know, told me, you know, helicopters are likely, the propellers are likely to melt and stuff if they get close to the building. But anyway, we're looking and we're seeing this helicopter move towards the window and then it turns around and that turnaround like if my heart dropped and how that felt to us on the street i don't know how that felt to you know the people within the building now the thing that really struck me was within about 10 hours i'm looking at the front cover of the evening standard and it has a picture of those two people taken from a, a horizontal angle meaning that the person that took the photo was in that helicopter um if you juxtapose that with what happened to a gentleman by the name of Omega, who lived in Chesterton Walk, one of the walkways next to Grenfell, there was a young man who jumped from the 15th floor. His body was taken and put in Omega's block, basically by his front door. Now, Omega, at 5 a.m. in the morning, is coming to his, his, his flat and he's seeing this, this body on the floor. Now, he took footage of it and put it online. It's important to understand without that footage, the family wouldn't have known that this member of their family had, had died at the point that he died. Um, but Omega was then contacted by a journalist who he met with and the journalist set him up to be arrested. He then served three months in prison for taking that footage of a dead body in his in his vicinity, in his locality. Now, what that encapsulates to me is the way that following the fire, you have to remember that prior to the fire, the Save Our Silchester campaign, of which I was a part of, was really going from strength to strength. The local plan that RBKC had put together was to demolish, potentially, all of our blocks. Grenfell, as far as we understood, was the only one that was safe so these people would still be in their homes because um, it had been refurbished. And so the way we perceive people from Grenfell who were active in the Save Our Silchester campaign is, okay, you lot are okay. It's us that stand to lose our homes. What actually happened, though, obviously, was that that refurbishment that we thought was a concession to replace the option of knocking down was the thing that killed them. And it was austerity inside, but it was deregulation on the outside of the building um, that did this. Now, the reason why I use the Omega and the particular family um, having their picture taken by the Evening Standard is because I think an ultra visibility has followed uh, the community in both a negative and a positive way. The negative way, obviously, is that, you know, in my view, when history is told, the bereaved, the survivors and the residents, even in terms of convictions for Grenfell related quote unquote crimes, will be more criminalized than the ministers who sat on key changes to building regulations that they should have made, um, more criminalized than employees within companies who it has been proven active with lethal negligence. And it's that surveillance and that visibility, that ultra visibility and that very critical eye, you know, you have to remember that this is a community that the British state and the British establishment had understood a particular way throughout the war on terror years, unfortunately. So within a lot of our, our ways of dealing with the community were counter terror stuff put in there. And that already is a form of surveillance. And the way the state understands state and or corporate crime is always social order first, whether it's Abavan, whether it's Piper Alpha, whether it's Hillsborough. And it's not that the mechanisms that exist within the state's capacity are to give us justice. It's quite the opposite. They are to manage injustice um, and to project um, the, the force of the law in other directions. And so unfortunately, I feel that has happened. In terms of the Save Our Silchester campaign, though, uh, 
the council backed off from the plan to demolish the rest of the blocks because Grenfell happened. The council were planning to lease the public library to a private school next door to it, and they backed off because Grenfell happened. So there are key concessions that the state has made that have directly affected even the demographics of the community in potentially a positive way. How long that will last, though, and I think the key point to always remember is that Grenfell was exceptionalised rather than generalised. When it comes to landlords ignoring their tenants to whom they have a duty of care, that is standard procedure, whether it's Labour councils, Tory councils, whether it's in Manchester, whether it's in Liverpool, whether it's in Croydon. When it comes to building regulations, that is across the board. Even if, even if the council were to actually be responding to the complaints of the residents, the building regulations had made it such that the council had very little involvement in what classification of cladding was used on the building. So, you know, these, these are major parts of the story, I guess, but we'll probably get into it a bit more. Yeah, no, thank you. There's uh, a lot of food for thought there. Um, Paul, I wonder if you could, uh, you know, uh, I found it interesting what Fatima said because I'd heard it amongst so many, including um, soon after the tragedy had happened, after one of the, the kind of commemorative marches, I was in the area and we went to a Palestinian uh, place to get some food and uh, a waitress was from Gaza had said, I didn't think that leaving Gaza, this is, this is, these are the scenes that I would find in the streets of London. Uh, that this kind of tragedy, and you know, as Fatima said, this isn't what we expected of the UK. But and so I wonder if you could, uh, what your thoughts are on that. You know, was this uh, the exception, or was this just a demonstration of, you know, the the deeper dehumanization of uh, dehumanizing conditions uh, and treatment and oppression of the poor and racialized communities in Britain. Yeah, thanks very much. And I again, I, I I was still living in London at the time, um, but in, in sort of Green Lane, some some place where I can't. I remember waking up to the news and seeing some of the footage, and I just the, the sort of visceral terror that I felt looking at it, and sort of empathising with the people. And I, I can't even imagine what the communities there must have experienced, and the the decisions and the the, the pain that families must have gone through. In terms of it being an exception, uh, Karim has already touched on this, but absolutely not. Uh, Karim mentioned Aberfan, he mentioned Hillsborough. The one of the forces that came to mind for me around it was Hurricane Katrina in the US, particularly the Ninth Ward uh, in the US which was predominantly African-American, working class and poor, and how that was absolutely neglected uh, during Hurricane Katrina. They still don't know how many people died uh, during Hurricane Katrina, uh, mainly African-American. Uh, they were also told to sort of stay put for a time, which was the advice that was given to uh, the residents in Grenfell when the fire force um, broke out. And, and it is, it's systemic neglect. Uh, and, and what an incident uh, like... Grenfell reveals is what John Pilger, who's an author who many people will know, he's got this concept of unpeople. Uh, and unpeople are those people that aren't deemed newsworthy, particularly by Western outlets. So we don't think about daily the children that die from preventable diseases around the world, or the people that are killed in conflicts that don't serve some purpose in Western sort of government propaganda and how they're just not worth reporting on. Well, those unpeople, as Pilger puts it, uh, and again, he's uh, he, he sort of using this as a criticism of the mainstream media. They walk our streets every day. They're our families, our friends, our neighbours. These are the people who are systematically neglected and systematically disadvantaged in in so many different ways. And what an incident like the Grenfell disaster did is it it rips the mask off. Um, and especially in this era of of sort of hyper media exposures, Karen mentioned, you can't ignore it. No. We'll come on probably a bit later to discuss of how then people can metabolize that, how that horrendous, this must never happen again incident then gets in different ways shifted around and it becomes about, well, what about the people that were there? Should they have been there? And how culpable are they? And then it becomes a long term public inquiry that drags out the process without really addressing the key issues. So we can come back on to all of that. But at least in that moment, in that ruptural sort of moment, we, we are confronted with all of the inequalities that this society produces structurally on a daily basis. And again, the, the, the people who died in Grenfell, the communities that are affected, again, both Fatima and, and uh, Karina touched on this, that the 
the confluence of circumstances that produced the tragedy in Grenfell were entirely uh, conscious decisions around cutting corners, around cost, around gentrifying an area to try and continue the social cleansing of, of London to force out working class and working communities, especially from Kensington and Chelsea, which is one of the wealthiest uh, boroughs in, in the world, let alone in the UK, to try and force communities out of there to try and gentrify, force up the house prices and so forth. So corners were cut, profit was made. Krem has mentioned already that the companies um, who produce the cladding are effectively, due to Tory changes and, and reforms to the uh, regulatory system, are able to effectively run their own stress and their own risk tests and certify their own products effectively as safe. And again, it's all about creaming off as much profit as they can. And the fact that the people who are affected are primarily BA, BME and from those communities, again, isn't surprising. So for the 10 years running leading up to Grenfell in the era of austerity in Britain, it was disproportionately BAME communities that were affected. It was the working class in general, it was BMA communities uh, even more so, and it was BA, BME women even more so than that. So the layers of sort of intersecting exploitation and oppression create these conditions that when there's a disaster, a so-called natural disaster or an accident, it's no accident who suffers. It, it's always depressingly predictable who suffers. And we see it again with COVID. COVID. Again, uh, with COVID-19, with the outbreak of it, the particular form of COVID-19 couldn't have been anticipated as such, but we always know that there's the possibility of these outbreaks. And again, who is it that's disproportionately affected? Working class, BME communities, again, failed by the same sort of policies that prioritise short-term profit, that prioritise efforts to try and rush back to getting back to normal or getting back to business as usual. So yeah, unfortunately, Grenfell was was horrendous uh, and the fight for justice both Fatima and Graham know more about that than me the fight for justice goes on and will go on but it is unfortunately not exceptional it just reveals the structural reality of the injustices that are reproduced in Britain by the state by the capitalist system uh, and the race and class dimensions of it actually linked to the point about the COVID-19 pandemic uh, do, do you feel that the response to Grenfell uh, to the people in Grenfell in the lead up and after uh, the fire because the neglect continued even beyond. Uh, we know that the inquiries not even, the conclusions are not even due until uh, uh, 2022 at least. Um, and so do you feel that the government's response has effectively been, um, uh, has been similar and that it continues to be the same uh, communities disproportionately impacted by these forms of neglect, um, because I know Fatima, you work in you work in health services, and so you have quite a deep insight on you know uh, on those impacts from within that particular system on these communities in pre-pandemic. I think absolutely. I think again, another disaster in the form of the pandemic has again highlighted the inequalities, the lack of the lack of understanding by systems of their communities and of what their communities is made up of. And then there's, so they start, so the response is very much done through a, a lens that actually doesn't value the asset based in communities, doesn't understand the cultural, social, political, religious context of the communities that, that we're supposed to be serving, certainly in health. I mean, I'm sure we've all seen images of you know, sort of the willingness to want to respond, but not knowing how to, especially in relation to vaccines in COVID. And I see, I see COVID is very much a, a, a replication of what happened in Grenfell, is that we respond in a chaotic way. We respond in a knee-geatric and a reactive way rather than a thoughtful way. And the reason why people respond in that is because they have no real relationship with the communities that they serve. They don't understand who we are. They don't know where, where, where we're from. They consider all communities as, as either hard to reach or accessible. And unfortunately, the hard to reach category is made up of predominantly black and ethnic minority uh, population and refugee and asylum seeking population. But, but, but my, I, I suppose what we've learned through the pandemic is if you don't if you don't understand the communities, if you don't have that relationship, you will. There will be a sense of indifference. I mean, I, I remember working in Kensington and Chelsea way before Grenfell. I was very acutely aware of the fact that I worked for, the, for a children and adolescent mental health service clinic based in, in Lancaster Road, which is not very far from where Grenfell is, is situated. And I just remember feeling 
hearing that there was going to be a, a secondary school built at the foot of Grenfell Tower. I just remember sort of thinking with my colleagues that this was a deliberate attempt to siphon off a section of the population and actually almost kettle for, you know, kettle it into some kind of geography where it could all be contained, all of its diversity and culture could be contained in one area, including where their children go to school. And I just remember that, how can you build a secondary school at the foot of, a, of the tower? And I remember on the night of the fire, when I was speaking to my granddaughter, I also remember the day that she was offered a place in that school. I remember her saying, I don't want to go to a school that I can see from my bedroom window. I want to go to school in a bus. And on the night of the fire, talking to her, I remembered what she was saying. And it was that very school that actually hampered access to actually get, get to people on the night. So, the, you know, the, there was always an arm's length approach to the North Kensington community. And COVID, again, has highlighted there's an arm's length approach to communities up and down the country. So, yes, the response is chaotic not thoughtful, not meaningful, and doesn't take into people's context. Um, and their social, political, you know, their, their diversity doesn't value it. Loki, I don't know if you had... Yeah, to... I just wanted to add to what Fatima said about Kensington Aldridge Academy. At the point when the refurbishment took place and the gym that I used to go to was also knocked down to build another gym, it was a perfectly functioning gym with a swimming pool, um, you know, you had the really important green pitches that everyone in the community loved and used. I think I scored one of the last goals on those pitches before they were knocked down. I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, and Grenfell Action Group actually warned that the building of this school, Kensington Aldridge Academy, in the place of the green pitches, would block off the access of the um, fire brigade from three sides of the tower. And obviously that played out. That was clear to be the case on the night. London is an absolute bonanza. It's a festival of profit for construction companies. One thing that really stuck with me is you have to remember that Grenfell was the product of a bipartisan orthodoxy of neoliberal necropolitics, which stretched from you know, while you had Ronan Point in 1966, when the Lars uh, Nielsen technique of house building led to four people dying and part of the building just completely collapsing, you know, it's not even uh, a, a specific um, thing that came from neoliberalism, but it's obviously been massively exacerbated and made more likely to happen by the neoliberal harnessing of our political elite. When Michael Heseltine under the Thatcher government cut what was 300 plus pages of building regulations and replaced them with around 20 pages of building regulations, when those building regulations were performance-based rather than prescriptive in terms of material to be included in them, you see that lurching of Thatcher's legacy across the community. And what always struck me is, as, as deeply, deeply interesting was the way that when the refurbishment was happening, the boarded up side of Grenfell Tower had written on it when Margaret Thatcher died, RIP Maggie. Someone else came along, sp sprayed out the RIP and wrote FU Maggie. And we weren't to know that this legacy, and what I found also sad, to be honest, was the ease with which Michael Heseltine was able to come forward and actively support the Liberal Democrat um, candidate for Kensington, who really was placed there to split the vote and avoid uh, Corbynite winning in Kensington for a second time. But the lack of criticality with which people received the involvement of Michael Heseltine. Yes, approved document B, which is the, the, the part of the building regulations which provided a creative ambiguity for companies to interpret um, it as allowing a certain type of cladding because rather than being the face, it was the internal, the core. So P. Renabon, the iconic cladding, had six millimeters of polyethylene. 
So the idea that the construction companies had is as long as you coat it with aluminium, it's not the face of the cladding that is flammable in the way that the core is flammable. And so that is an interpretation of approved document B. And you've got to remember that it wasn't just Eric Pickles and um, other Tory figures that sat on approved document B. It was also John Prescott, you know, who even among much of the left is strangely and bizarrely celebrated. This is the fact. Grenfell was an indictment of this bipartisan dedication to policies which facilitate the accumulation of capital for the biggest business in the world and, um, and harm human life, ultimately. In terms of when we're talking about the inquiry, there is a potential worry that it has defanged to some extent the criminal investigation by, in some cases, allowing immunity for certain figures that testify. Moreover, there is the gentleman's agreement that we've now understood through the inquiry, the criminal investigation has been run with, whereby institutions involved in Grenfell were given the chance to submit evidence against themselves. So they were given the freedom, rather than having their offices raided, as they should have been, rather being surveilled, as they should have been, they are actually given the opportunity to get together whatever evidence they think pertains to their crime and hand it in to the police. And so obviously some of them have come out and said, oh, we've, we, by a mistake, we, we disposed of the evidence. By a mistake, we lost the evidence. You know, it's this gentleman's agreement, which is actually symptomatic of the entire structure of simply not caring. And on top of that, when you think about the fact that we've been told inquiry, 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 the government has spent millions of pounds of taxpayers' money on inquiry, inquiry, inquiry. Boris Johnson stood up in Parliament and said, we will implement the recommendations of the inquiry. At the end of the first phase, they turn around and say, oh, Jenrick, that scumbag idiot, Robert Jenrick, turns around and says, oh, we have to consult with the business, the business sector first before we implement the recommendations, which were fairly tame anyway, and mostly focused on uh, the fire brigade, really, the recommendations. And so they haven't even been implemented. So you've got us to invest ourselves in a process that you are not even invested in to begin with. And on top of that, let's not forget that Boris Johnson was responsible as mayor of London for the cutting of 29 fire engines from the fire brigade, the closing of 10 fire stations in London, two of them close to Grenfell, Knightsbridge and Westminster. If you are going to be calling political figures to talk to them about their inability to deal with approved, doc to find the time to deal with approved document B, then bring the prime minister of this country to talk in front of the inquiry. We're ready and waiting. But at the end of the day, it's not about the justice they give us, because they're going to give us injustice. It's about the justice we give them. It's about our ability to communicate with the communities who have factories of these com companies existing within them. It's about our ability to communicate with those communities, to show them they are us and we are them. And if we were them, we'd shut down those factories. And that is the type of power that we will be able to assert. It's about us being linked with the trade union movement and saying, hold on, how is it that a mile away, less than a mile away from Grenfell, four years after the fire, you have a primary school that has insulation, combustible insulation in it, made by Kingspan, one of the companies that put combustible materials on Grenfell. If you have workers who are members of your union, Tell them not to deal with the killer materials. It's a very, very basic act of solidarity that should have happened immediately after the fire. These were the type of things that had to happen and should have happened and can still happen and will happen. Yeah, we're not going to go quietly into the night. That's not what's going to happen here. We're not going to accept that you killed our neighbors. That's not going to happen here. So don't be worried about the justice you give us. Be worried about the justice we give you. Absolutely. Um, no, uh, I think that especially given the centrality of 
housing, quality housing, access to housing, um, and that also has resurfaced in the time of the pandemic, as we were all forced to be confined within them. The disparities, um, you know, the, the the divide between <laughs> the response um, and and uh, the comfort um, uh, that was assured um, between the rich and the poor in this time. I wonder if Paul, you could uh, talk to us a little bit about this, about why the question of housing uh, is is such a, a kind of stark indication of the social divides within our society, but also, as Kareem said, as points of organizing uh, and, and ways in which we can apply pressure across communities um, on questions of, you know, class and race, um, how, how we go about that effectively. Thanks, Marlia, and thanks to Fatima and Kareem as well for that. So just to pick up on a few of the threads and, and to respond to what you just um, asked about, Maya. So the, like Kareem mentioned it already in passing, but but again, this is we, we all still live in the long shadow of Thatcher here uh, in so many different ways. Uh, and, and one of the things that Thatcher did, which was which fundamentally and dramatically reshaped Britain in key respects, was the attack on public housing, was introducing the right to buy scheme, the selling off of public housing stock. And what and part of what that has done then, it has fueled the process within Britain of the increased uh, commercialization of housing. Uh, so it's where property in Britain, generally speaking, is not viewed as somewhere to raise a family and build up memories and you know have decent shelter and so forth. It's an asset. It's something that can be bought and sold, and nowhere epitomizes that more than London. So again, this is part of the whole dynamics around gentrifying in and around Grenfell, trying to force communities out. Fatima touched on the point when she said that the the, the councils that are supposed to save these people don't know the people. I'd say it's, it's even worse than that. They view them as enemies. They view them as people that are, are in a place where they shouldn't be, because this is prime real estate in West London, uh, and these people, these undeserving people, have no business here. This land could be sold for tens of millions and redeveloped and we could have horrendous apartment blocks with swimming pools in the sky uh, for a very tiny percentage of the population and everybody else can be moved out to East Ham or to the very far north of London so this is part of a massive, it's the same in Manchester as well, I live in Manchester now but it's the exact same in Manchester, Manchester has got a massive housing bubble which is leading to massive inequalities, the community's been neglected, uh, Loki mentioned Prescott in passing but another one of the um, darlings of the sort of miserably deluded British left is Andy Bournem and Andy Bournem has a property developer as his champion for homelessness in Manchester, where they hand over tracts of public land to private developers, well, prices and rents go through the roof, and some of the dynamics that we've seen in London are now being replicated uh, and at accelerated pace in Manchester, Leeds, Birmingham, all these other bigger cities. So this is absolutely built into the system. And again, that's that's the key thing here. It's not, again, which it sometimes will be painted by as this horrible aberration, this horrible accident. It's the logical consequence and the logical outcome of a system that prioritizes short-term profit and development over the lives of human beings but not all human beings certain human beings those people that are disposable those people that can die whether it's because of covid whether it's in uh, whether it's in grenville whether it's hurricane katrina in ireland many years ago we we had the uh, stardust fire where a number of 48 working class people mainly died in a nightclub fire nobody held accountable you know this this these are people who are disposable and the system wants to get back on track towards accumulation in terms of how do we respond to it and build responses to it, I think I think the point Loki made is absolutely crucial. And again, I sort of for my sort of um day job as it were for to pay the bills i teach law so that's part of what i do but i've also been involved in politics for 20 plus years and i've seen it time and time again in this country in ireland and elsewhere how inquiries are used precisely to uh, deflate campaigns that's the idea behind it you, you 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 sort of smother people with documentation you coerce them into particular forms that are acceptable within the form of an inquiry you, you can say this you can say that present yourself in this way you even with the best will in the world lawyers find themselves trying to construct acceptable and relatable victims who will then sort of you know attract some sort of sympathy and you end up then losing the core demands of justice that the community have now both Loki and Fatima will know far better than me uh, what the community will consider to be justice and what the people affected by this will consider to be justice and that has to be the priority because Loki is right this inquiry won't even deliver the modest form of liberal justice that it's supposed to deliver let alone the justice that the community deserves and demands but there are other ways to achieve justice and some of what Loki is 
you've touched on is crucial as well about linking the trade unions into this. A, a historic um, slogan of the trade union movement was an injury to one is an injury to all. And we have to make this out that what happened in Grenfell happened to all of us. I say all of us, as I mean us as a class. These were our friends, relatives, neighbours. Even if you don't live in that area, it could be the people you know and people live next to you next because that's how the system treats us. And COVID has reinforced that. So absolutely, the unions recently in Britain, in particular, the Fire Brigade Union, have been exemplary when uh, Palestine Action for Palestine have occupied the um, uh, Elbit uh, factories that produce weapons that murder, again, murder acceptable, acceptably killed people in the views of the Western media, children in Gaza, other people in Palestine. And when they've taken action against it and the police have called the fire brigade around to try and remove the protesters, the fire brigade have refused to do it. They've said that we're, we support this action. We're not a law enforcement agency and we won't intervene in this. So we can try and generalise that around these companies that have constructed these materials. The problem we have now as well is that Loki mentioned Generic, who's a particularly snivelling Tory in a, in a sort of long uh, gallery of snivelling Tories. The, the problem that the British ruling class face now is even if they wanted to comply with some of these recommendations, the pressures that British capitalism is under now post-Brexit, post this crisis, means they want to do as little as possible to in any way inhibit industry. So the idea that they will act on these uh, recommendations, even these very moderate rec modest recommendations, is even more distant. And even one of the few things they did act on, the idea of providing some resources to remove this cladding, they provided, I think, around £400 million. But they took that from the general housing budget, which means that the working class as a class are paying for this crisis again. We're going to get less affordable public decent public housing because public funding is going to be used to compensate and make up for the failures of the government and private corporations and this again isn't and it's, it, i think it's a crude i think you framed it well Mali and, and karem as well but this isn't exceptional this isn't unusual this is structural uh, this system and again we're only we're only really sort of on the precipice now of, of global climate breakdown in many different ways and the impacts that will have it's the working class who will pay for this in many different ways so unless we build those networks of solidarity recognize those shared struggles we're involved in not just in the workplace but beyond that and start building up air resilience and air capacity to hold both the state but and, and again Loki is crucially important to say both the Labour Party and the Conservative Party as well as the sort of Lib Dems will hold them accountable and demand the sort of justice that air communities is, will deem acceptable well then we'll be forced time and time again to pay you can see them lining it up already billions has been handed to um, corporations and the wealthy during the COVID pandemic they're already setting the stage for the working class to pay for this uh, on the other side of the, the sort of lockdown and the return to normal, as it were. The same will happen with climate breakdown. Again, it's just to mention in passing, again, how it's only certain lives that are affected. There was a report a few years back about how lots of the billionaires from Silicon Valley, through a variety of algorithms and, and sort of research, have found that New Zealand is one of the safest places to be in the context of climate change and so forth. So they've bought up massive tracts of land in New Zealand, built compounds for themselves, bought New Zealand citizenship. <laughs> they're, already to, they're already to make a run for it. You know? and so the reality is, is that this is nobody's coming to save us but us. You know, this was the sort of slogan of the Black Panthers, the people save the people. And we have to sort of re build all those things this is one good thing that can come from grenfell uh, grenfell was absolutely tragic but the resilience of the community the way they came together the, the 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 sort of message that their resistance and their continued determination shows to the rest of us is crucially important so i think that's one good thing that will come from it in time absolutely thank you um and fatima i would uh, you know say is very much proactively involved in in the continuation of that resilience, but also shaping what the future look like looks like. Um, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about some of the work that you're doing with the youth around this, because the question of trauma remains four years on, um, and and is such an important. Uh, the questions of mental health are, are so, so so vitally important and continue to be overlooked. Um, with you know the state behaves as though. Uh, time heals all wounds, but it's absolutely not true at times, you know, those wounds um, are, are, are worsened, if anything. Yeah, I, I think, I think over the last four years, what's, what's, what's been clearly evident is the fact that community and community boys are willing and are stepping up to actually, as Paul and, and, and Loki have said, to actually uh, not deliver their own justice, but to actually hold people to account. And I think the system, uh, uh, you know, underestimated 
the Grenfell community, just like they underestimate all other communities that are not made up of the the usual kind of uh, uh, demographic. And I think they have underestimated. There's a lot of resilience and a lot of scope. And and also, I know I know we're kind of talking about some of, some of the sort of the contemptuous aspects of systems. But there's also quite a lot of hope because when you treat people with contempt, you know, and when you when you kind of um, isolate certain population, something like Grenfell happens, and it and it really infuses people's um, energy, be it through anger, be it through commitment to change, be it through. And I suppose I'm one of those people that I am very hopeful, and and I and I have seen people absolutely committed to never ever going back to being um uh, uh you know sidelined or silenced and there's a huge amount of work to do like like you said we are dealing with a very traumatized community Grenfell was a collective trauma not an individual trauma and I think systems need to mobilize themselves to actually start responding to a community as a whole and the only way they can do that is by actually building bridges and actually making firm commitments to re-establish relationships I suppose the proof of the, the, the puddings in the eating, you know, we're still at that kind of trying to build bridges, but we'll see. And one of, one of the things that um, I kind of hear over and over again in the Grenfell community is the ask is very different. People want change, uh, the system, so that all of those who work in public services have real insight and understanding of who, who we as communities are, as individuals, as families, I think anything else assumes tokenistic tick box exercise that systems do just to bypass whatever funding you know uh, uh, priorities they've got in engaging and consulting with us and and probably building a much more hopeful relationships. We are still doing a lot of bridge, bridge building. Um, my work involves in working a lot with young people because, like I said, I'm nearly. You know, I don't want to keep sort of, you know, my my grandchildren, I suppose, my incentive. And it's a very, very personal and selfish reason to be involved in this uh, in this uh, process. But I always I try and look for their look at their future. I don't want my grandchildren to be defined as poor Grenfell victims, as, you know, children of the Grenfell you know, community. They are you know, vibrant young people that have a, 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 you know, fantastic future ahead of them. And what I want to instill in them and many other young people in Grenfell is that there is a hopeful legacy that they can change. And having people like Loki and people, in, you know, sort of real voices in, in Grenfell United that actually are, are, are kind of modelling that behaviour of speaking up for themselves, of challenging and of you know, you know, bettering themselves and really just taking taking the challenge. And for me, that's the hope of legacy. But there's a lot of work to do, uh, Mali. I can't profess to sit at the now. There's a lot of trauma in the community, and COVID now has impacted double. So it's you know, it's Grenfell take two. Of course, the other thing that we have to contend with as a as a system, and I work for the NHS, and I think my role within Central Northwest London Mental Health Services is to actually try and change it. So I'm the insider outsider. So I'm trying to amplify the voice of the community in a system that finds it very, very difficult to hear and, and tends to, to, to re resort to type and just offer clinical tra trauma informed services that are nice, guidelines sensitive. So we're trying really hard to change that narrative and to actually bring the community and make them at the um, centre of our service delivery. So we're doing a lot of collaborative uh, uh, partnership with community organisations, with grassroots organisation, and particularly with young people. So we have a uh, Grenfell young, you know, young Grenfell NHS ambassadors that we're hoping that they will go out and start to kind of change the the the, the, the culture of NHS systems. Um, we're also taking the learning from Grenfell because. It would be a sad indictment if we didn't honour the, you know, the, the lives of those many people that were lost without sort of taking that legacy forward and looking beyond Grenfell. So that's that's the work that we're doing, working with Grenfell United and other community voice to actually progress that 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 um, that ethos is going to be hugely important for the next generation. Thank you, Fatima. Uh, I, I hope so. Uh, and I think that also 
um, you know, the, the, the call uh, c continues to reach people. The, you know, the recent action that Paul mentioned by Palestine Action at uh, uh, Arconic Factory in Birmingham um, showed the relations between, you know, the violence experienced and that had been experienced, the tragic loss of life, loss of life in Grenfell uh, and, and to that of the violence that, you know, continues to be uh, meted out against the Palestinian people. And I think that that was not only a stark reminder that four years may have passed, um, but these questions have certainly not been answered, let alone the solutions been put forward, uh, nor the assurance that it will never happen again, um, but also that how much the question, the tragedy, uh, reaches um, that experience by people around the world that these systems are not unique uh, to this particular to, to this particular country or these people, um, but but you know th the system goes beyond us and and to a certain extent that could overwhelm us and that could make us think that this this monster is this beast is too too big to take down. But on the other hand, it could also uh, which is what I, I feel a lot of, you know, the activists have demonstrated shows that how many more of us are angry, are upset, are impacted by this and how many more of us there are um, that could do something about it. Um, and, and sharing that resilience across borders um, is something that we have to, you know, continue, continue to do. Um, I, uh, perhaps Loki, you could uh, discuss so, some of these uh, kind of some of these bridges, but also what your thoughts were uh, following that action in particular? I think the interesting thing, especially um, uh, about this issue of how, you know, you have $5.5 trillion given every year prior to the pandemic in subsidies by governments in the world to um, fossil fuel companies, you have a situation where 50% of carbon emissions are believed to come from the extractive industries. Now, this causes a situation where governments need to lower carbon emissions. So then what happens? Well, then the Kyoto agreements happen and Britain comes back with this number that it needs to, it needs to put things down. So then what happens? Well, you have a lobby group, Brofoma, who, had, who represent at least some of the companies that put flammable um, cladding on there, who then come and say, subsidize us to insulate buildings across the country, including hospitals, hotels, schools, care homes. Yeah. And what then happens is the government says, well, you know, in the case of Arconic, their main shareholder is Elliott Management. Elliott Management not only is a donor to Boris Johnson, personally, but also to the Conservative Party. So this incestuous relationship with big business and the very companies and, and the government and the, and the people deciding these things. Let's not forget that the technical director of Celatex, one of the companies that put um, uh, flammable insulation on Grenfell, was the advisor to Sajid Javid at the time of Grenfell on building regulations when Sajid Javid was housing minister. So there's so many of these incestuous relationships. So it's like you deal with climate change, which is caused by neoliberalism, with more neoliberalism that kills people. You know, and this was the question that I put to Naomi Klein. I said, okay, well, if, if, if you know, part of this green push, aside from not dealing with the extract extractive um, aspect of it, is going to be insulating buildings on a level that we've never seen before in this country. You know, the government has a quota of how many buildings it needs to insulate every year. We're in a situation where Literally, since 2019, you've had 76 schools have combustible cladding put on them. You've had 25 hospitals and care homes have combustible cladding put on them. 11 uni buildings with combustible cladding put on them. So the, and even in the case where we're looking at the vast majority of buildings in social housing that have flammable um, materials on them have had them removed. But a lot of those contracts have gone to Ryden, the very same company that put the cladding on Grenfell in the first place. So the problem is where the problem is the answer. Uh, the people that cause the problem are the solution. And it's that circle. Now, the gap, which is interesting and a contradiction, which hasn't really been addressed thus far, is where you have Thatcher's idea of a homeowning democracy, 
leading to hundreds of thousands, if not over a million leaseholders in this country in desperately unsafe homes. They were pushed into the position of first time buyer. And this, 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 this leasehold system, which is not present in the rest of Europe, which seems strange to a lot of people. Um, and, and that's the situation they're in. And you literally have nine out of 10 of those that were spoken to saying that their mental health has deteriorated as a result of being stuck in a Grenfell block, which they may be paying a mortgage on, which they're being told they have to pay £40,000 to, um, to take the stuff off the building. And they never even chose to have the stuff on the building. What our system can assimilate is 24-hour watch workers who can stay awake in the block to make sure to see if a fire happens and then tell everyone what the system can assimilate is changing the stay put policy in the fire brigade what the system can assimilate is hyper surveillance of those kind of communities because that's job creations for the security services let's not forget that but what the system can't assimilate is us acting as one hand with the unions in this country. What the system can't assimilate is us acting as one hand with the communities, not only those in those buildings who cut across many different social stratifications also. You know, that building in Canary Wharf, you've got flats in there worth 1.3 million pounds. So how is it that that building is even affected by something that affected Grenfell? Act as one hand also with groups like Palestine Action, who are saying Arconic, the company that put the cladding on Grimfeld, the PE Rennebond, also made the F-35, which rained death and devastation on the people of Gaza. There is more of us than there is of them. We need to act in concert with all of these different people around the country and around the world and make absolutely clear that we're not having it anymore. It's time for clarity. Um, Paul, I wonder if you have some very brief words of wisdom uh, before we close. In terms of wisdom, I've nothing to add to what Fatima and, and Graham have said because it's it's fantastic. But I, I just pick up the point that, that Graham made there as well. So Malcolm X had this had this great line that we're not outnumbered, we're out organized. Uh, and that that's where we are still at the moment. And and so I, I think what Fatima has said is crucially important that that what should come out of Grenfell. Grenfell was an absolute tragedy. They, again, and 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 even more tragic because it was foreseeable because the decisions, the conscious decisions that were taken, that put people's lives at risk and 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 consciously relegated uh, the, the the sort of protection of those people's lives below other considerations makes it a double tragedy. But Grenfell should then also become something that we mark on our collective history. Grenfell as a turning point. Grenfell as a group crucial point where we began to more clearly understand all the chains of abuse and exploitation and all the systems uh, that, that that link us together, that make us that sort of singular unit that needs to act together and to overcome it. And it's linked to everything else. So you mentioned the, the protesters that, that targeted Arconic, but I mean, I think back to um, a few years back after uh, Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson in the US and protesters in Ferguson, protesters in Gaza and protesters in Gezi Park in Turkey identified that they were all being shot at with the same uh, type of tear gas that was made by a company I can't remember exactly where in the US and the protesters in Palestine were messaging the protesters in Ferguson saying this is what to do to protect yourself from this and, and so people are waking up to it and again one of the key things here and Loki has touched on it there about these people who've been promised sort of Thatcher's dream of home ownership and it's turned out to be a lie it's about it's about what we value. And the thing is that the system, the state and capitalists and various business, they value profit maximization in the short term, right? We collectively value other things. We value community. We value people having decent housing, and not because they can afford it, not because they could pay for it, but because we value that for everybody, irrespective of race, irrespective of nationality. And then we link that up on a global scale because as climate, I mean, some of you may have seen the news in Canada in the last two days, each day has exceeded its record uh, ever recorded temperature. Global climate breakdown is, is upon us. And the problem at the moment, and I think Loki touched on this when he mentioned Naomi Klein, is that an awful lot of the Green New Deal talk 
Outlook is very much focused on how to make things better for people in the already affluent countries. We need to make this the global challenge, the global challenge to ensure security and a decent standard of living and justice for people around the world. And when we do that, as we build, as we work together in different ways to build that better future, Grenfell is part of our shared history and Grenfell is part of the reason why we act in the ways in which we do collectively to build a better world. And I think that the work that Fatima and others is doing is crucial in that respect. Well, thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much to the speakers uh, for taking the time out um, for, you know, to keep updated on future webinars from the New Arab. Uh, you can find the New Arab on Twitter, Facebook, all social media platforms online. A few articles that have been written by Loki and I, uh, uh, you know, and, and contributions um, by other writers on the question of Grenfell. Uh, so please check out that archive uh, for updates to support all those still campaigning for justice uh, and to join any future commemorations, follow Grenfell United and Grenfell Speaks on all social media platforms as well. Thank you all again uh, for joining us um, this evening. <laughs>